be a nun in the truest sense. You don't want to spoil your vocation by mingling with the foul-smelling grit of worldly life, so don't glance back, longing for your home and family. Stirring up a hornet's nest. Little Gao spent the rainy months working around the house and playing with her cousins. She was a happy, cheerful girl, but she missed her mother's calm and comforting presence. She worked hard to please her father, Bun Ma, but he often appeared distracted by some inner turmoil. He frequently left home in the morning and did not return until late at night. On lunar observance days, Gao followed the women folk to Wat Nong Nong and joined her mother for daily chores, chatting incessantly about life at home. What she said worried Mei Chi Gao. Her husband's regular disappearances were unusual, and from what Gao described, he seemed to be intoxicated when he returned. Mei Chi Gao decided, for her daughter's sake, that she should visit home occasionally to help with the housework and to keep an eye on the situation. Entering the house, her husband's absence was the first thing she noticed. Mei Chi Gao spent whole days cleaning, laundering, and cooking for her daughter, but Bun Ma never appeared. During the last month of her retreat, Mei Chi Gao went home once a week, but she never once caught sight of him. Rumors soon reached her that he was secretly having an affair with a woman from another village, a young widow with two children. She was told that he had started drinking and carousing in her absence. Mei Chi Gao was repelled by her husband's behavior. Now weary of her marriage and wishing to make the noble path her life, the thought of returning home was unbearable to her. While Mei Chi Gao was morally obliged to keep her word, her husband's failure to adhere to the fundamental rules of moral conduct jeopardized the future of their marriage. As the retreat approached its final days, Mei Chi Gao agonized over her next course of action. She felt no desire to return to married life, but she was deeply concerned about the well-being of her daughter. She wanted to remain close to Gao, to guide and comfort her, but at ten years of age, Gao was still too young to live at the monastery with her mother. Besides, having renounced all worldly possessions, she had no means to support a child, but only the meager daily rations sufficient to sustain one person. Slowly, following several weeks of deliberation, the idea took shape in Meiji Gao's mind that she could combine both the household and the monastic worlds into her daily life. By spending her daylight hours at home being a mother and a wife, she could fulfill her worldly obligations. By passing her nights at the monastery, absorbed in meditation, she could pursue her spiritual goals. As unorthodox and unrealistic as the scheme seemed, she was willing, even desperate, to try it. So, as agreed, Meiji Gao returned home on the final day of the rains retreat. However, she had not relinquished her white robes, nor had she given up her vows. She remained an ordained Meiji, but wore a black skirt and blouse over her white robes to disguise her true intentions. She spent the morning and afternoon with Gao, completing the day's housework and cooking the evening meal. She planned to serve her family dinner and then quickly return to the monastery before dusk. When Gao and Bun Ma sat down to eat, she served the food but refrained from eating as she continued to observe the nun's training rule to forego meals after midday. Meiji Gao's abstinence provoked her husband's anger. He demanded the reason for her behavior and commanded her to sit and eat. When she refused, he leapt from his seat and tried to grab her by the arm. Meiji Gao jumped away, racing down the steps and away from the house. Bun Ma started to give chase, but was quickly restrained by Meiji Gao's older brother, Pin. He advised Bun Ma to let her go. Furious, Bun Ma bellowed that their marriage was finished. He yelled after her that if she wanted any part of their possessions, she could sue him in the provincial high court. As Meiji Gao ran through the village in the descending twilight, she felt drained by the pain and suffering of her worldly life, and at that moment decided to never disrobe. Meiji Gao arrived back at the monastery to find that everyone was worried about her. When she recounted what took place, the senior-most nun, Meiji Dang, scolded her. Why bother going back to your husband? You're just stirring up a hornet's nest. Take a lesson and stop sticking your hand into the fire. Even if you don't get burned, your reputation will be. Meiji Gao debated cutting off all contact with her husband, but her brothers urged her to settle her affairs with him first. Heeding their advice, she returned to the house several days later to negotiate a formal settlement to their marriage. 
Her husband was in no mood to compromise. He insisted that everything she had acquired since their marriage rightfully belonged to him. All that remained to decide was what to do with the belongings she had inherited from her parents. Having already renounced the world and its material possessions, Meiji Gao found it natural, even gratifying, to give everything she owned to Bun Ma and ask for nothing, except this, that she be allowed to keep the small knife she had always used to cut betel nut. Her husband quickly retorted that she had acquired the knife during their marriage and it was therefore his. With that final dismissal, Meiji Gao completely turned her back to domestic life and relinquished all worldly possessions without exception. Having finalized the agreement, Meiji Gao spoke privately with her daughter. Carefully and in detail, she told little Gao about the events reshaping their lives and asked for her patience and understanding. Learning of her mother's intention to leave home for good, little Gao pleaded with a childish innocence for the chance to accompany her mother and live with her at the monastery. With a heart heavy with sympathy, Meiji Gao described the austere conditions of a nun's life. She explained that since she had now given everything to her father, she had no means to adequately support her daughter. Besides, the monastery wasn't a place to bring up a child. Gently but insistently, Meiji Gao urged the child to remain with her father for the time being. She explained that Gao's father had the resources to look after her needs, and reassured Gao that his wealth and property would be her rightful inheritance. When Gao reached maturity, she could, if she still wished, live with her mother. Meiji Gao would welcome her with an open heart and be her spiritual guide and companion for life. Reluctantly, but obediently, Gao finally accepted her mother's urging to remain with her father. Meiji Gao walked back to the monastery in a quiet and pensive mood, replaying the pros and cons of her decision to permanently separate from her family and friends. In the end, her thoughts always came to rest with Prince Siddhartha, who left his wife and son and princely inheritance behind to follow the spiritual path unencumbered by worldly concerns. Although he abandoned universally honored parental obligations, he did so for the sake of the supremely noble goal of unconditional awakening to the truth of Tamma and the total destruction of the cycle of birth and death. Becoming a fully enlightened being, the Lord Buddha's achievement transcended all mundane sacrifices and all worldly conventions. Having freed himself from suffering, he had helped countless living beings do the same. With the ultimate goal of the holy life clearly and unalterably fixed in her mind, Meiji Gao was inspired to follow steadfastly in the Buddha's footsteps.